Good morning, good afternoon and good evening to all the urology trainees spread all over the world preparing for urology exams. Today in our exam series episode 58, we are going to look into various urological infection scenarios. We have our trainees with us. Uh, welcome. Can we start the scenario for you? Yes, please. Good. You are a reconstructive surgeon and uh, on a theater day you are scheduled to do artificial urinary sphincter insertion in a man suffering from post prostatectomy incontinence how are you going to prepare your day from the infection point of view um i would uh, i would uh, make sure that this patient is um, not having any acute infection to make sure that uh, his urine uh, is checked uh, beforehand and he if he has any comorbidities such as diabetes uh, i would make sure that uh, it is well controlled before the surgery and um, at the day of surgery um, i would make sure that the case will be placed on the first in the list and uh, i prefer to do in an orthopedic theater with the uh, laminar flow setup available and um, i would minimize the uh, number of people present in the theater and uh, lock the doors uh, to minimize the number of people crossing in the theater um, and I would give a pre-operative antibiotic prophylaxis before I start the, uh, uh, the case. So this is my uh, initial preparation for the surgery. So what is your choice of antibiotics? Um, I would give, uh, it, it, it will depend on the trust protocol. Um, I would like to give a Comoxiclev IV 1.2 gram in this patient. Okay, why with, you are selecting Comoxiclev? Yeah, I, I would add gentamicin as well, so that will give a broad coverage for him. Okay, so why are you selecting Comoxiclev? Uh, Comoxiclev uh, usually will cover most of the gram-positive organisms and um, the gentamicin can cover uh, gram-negative organisms. So in that case, um, I, would, I would have a broad spectrum coverage. So what about uh, anaerobic organisms? Um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure whether we need to cover anaerobic organism in his case. Um, so what type of infections you are expecting in this patient? It's a gram positives and uh, gram negative uh, organism because uh, <clears throat> because it's a surgery of the urinary tract and also uh, we will implant uh, with the skin incision. So I would expect a gram positive and gram negative possible infection in this case. <clears throat> You are doing the WHO check-in and the patient identification is checked, pre-operative antibiotics as you plan. So take us through the steps which you will concentrate predominantly to prevent infection. Uh, <clears throat> the, the main principles are the patients, uh, the area of uh, the surgical uh, incision is shaped and um, I would use the uh, uh, double glove technique and lung touch technique um, and um, the after the incision, uh, the, the, the we have options for the uh, the, the implants. Uh, we have either uh, medicated implants uh, can be used, or uh, the implants can be washed with uh, gentamicin antibiotic uh, at the time of surgery. And um, the the one of the main uh, principle is to uh, minimize the time of the surgery so as early as possible. What do you mean by the medicated implant? Uh, the the latest implants uh, comes with a uh, medicated uh, uh, with with a pre medicated uh, such as uh, uh, so I'm not exactly sure what what are the antibiotics so it's it's antibiotic uh, coated. Okay, what implants you you normally use for artificial urinary sphincter? The available ones are from uh, Coloplast. Um, uh, sorry, uh, the, the, the types of implants, uh, it could be malleable or inflatable. Inflatable could be two-piece or three-piece. I'm, I'm, I'm aware that two-piece uh, inflatable implants are not very much used these days, so three-piece uh, uh, inflatable implants are in common use. What do you mean by malleable? Uh, malleable is... Um, it's cylinder, cylindrical implants which is inserted in the corpora. It's, it's relatively easy to use, uh, it's uncomplicated. Uh, so uh, this, the, the, the difference between the 
uh, inflatable and malleable is uh, patient doesn't have to uh, inflate it uh, by themselves but the disadvantage is uh, it has a semi erected position compared to the inflatable implants what is the surgery you are planning for this patient um it is uh, so the surgical the technical wise uh, the uh, the, the cylinders, it, it, is, it will be an incision in the penoscrotal junction in, incision and the implants will be uh, placed in the, uh, the cylinders will be placed in the corpora and a uh, patient will have a pump in the scrotum and also okay. a reservoir in the uh, lower abdomen in the, uh, uh, recto, the, the, the suprapubic space. Okay, sorry to interrupt. Uh, we are planning for artificial urinary sphincter in a patient with previous prostatectomy related okay. incontinence. Can you revise your implants? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, so, um, can I have the last question again, please? Yeah, what is, what is the type of implant you are planning for this patient? Yeah, it's an AMS uh, uh, urethral sphincter, yeah. So the, uh, the, 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 the components of them is uh, uh, the, the cuff uh, which is placed around the bulba urethra and the reservoir and a uh, uh, pump in the scrotum. Okay, and um, so if the infection happens, what is the problem in this patient especially? Uh, the, the, the problem is that uh, we have to uh, take it out. Uh, we have to, uh, because uh, the, the patient can develop sepsis and also we, we, we have to uh, remove the implant. Okay, so any other precautions you need to take for preventing infections in these patients? Um, yeah, the preoperative uh, uh, assessment is very important to make sure that a patient doesn't have any inf uh, the, the, the infection uh, preoperatively. And um, uh, and as I said, the intraoperative precautions. And I would keep the patient on antibiotics after the procedure, uh, such as uh, Comoxiclav for five to seven days. Okay, are you giving for five days or seven days? Uh, five days. Okay, so let us assume in spite of this, this patient presented after three days with uh, some kind of small collection in the incision with a weeping wound, what is your plan? Um, I would see how severe it is. I want to see patient's general conditions, uh, uh, whether she, he has uh, high grade fever and we'll go through the blood reports uh, to see whether he has high uh, white cell count, CRP. And if the patient is um, uh, significantly ill, uh, I would admit him for IV antibiotics and the management of sepsis. Otherwise, uh, depending on, if, if it is uh, mild oozing, I would take uh, 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 pass for culture and uh, also if, if it is significant if needed to be drained um, I, would, uh, I, would, I would do an incision and drainage and observe him. How will you decide between conservative management and salvaging the prosthesis and the extreme measures of removing the prosthesis? What is your protocol? Um, the first thing is patient general condition. If the patient is uh, doesn't have systemic symptoms, uh, I can give antibiotics and observe him. And if the antibiotics is helping him and if the patient's condition is improving, uh, I can observe. On the other hand, if there is a large collection of pus and patient is systemically unwell, which is not responding to the antibiotics, then I, I, I would be more inclined to uh, go and remove the uh, artificial sphincter. So what is your protocol when you have to remove the processes due to infection? How are you going to prepare it? I would explain to the patient what has happened um, and, and, and then uh, take him to theatre under general anesthesia. I'll go through the same incision and uh, uh, remove the implant. So what may be the future possibilities for this patient's uh, symptoms of urinary incontinence? Um, by this time, I, I, I assume that he would have tried uh, all the other conservative measures and uh, uh, once the infection settles, um, uh, my option is I can give him a uh, bulking agent's uh, injection or else um, we can uh, try a reinsertion of uh, urinary sphincter later on at some point uh, once he is completely okay from his infection point of view. Yeah, it's 10 minutes.
okay good we'll stop there thank you vinod so how you think you did sorry mr d i completely gone out of the way yeah i'm i'm uh, quite surprised but it can happen so it's better to happen in these mock viva situations rather than in the real exam uh, so that gives you a kind of a um what can i say consciousness that uh, without your knowledge because it's very easy to confuse the implants which were so closely placed in the anatomical organ of penile and uh, uh, sphincter um this scenario is again a very real time scenario so in the infection table uh, it can be any any processes it may be a testicular processes articular penile sphincter or even a penile sphincter also of course penile implant i mean so you need to be very clear in few things i'm i'm happy with few things like uh, you are doing a urine specimen to make sure there is no urinary infection you are doing first in the list that's a very good habit laminar flow or you can use the flow which is present in the orthopedic implant theaters but having said that there is a huge amount of discussions you can bring in without touching anything of urinary incontinence sphincter related things because we are not interested in that thing that is a different scenario that's a neuro urology scenario or a prostate scenario while you can discuss the urodynamics and those things but here uh, you should start from something very basics like mrsa screening which we do for all the patients and especially in infection table you should tick the box of including the mrsa screening how are you going to do the mrsa screening uh where all places you take the swab and uh, so it's very important to know those very minuscule things what is happening in the pre operative clinic again when you are saying the antibiotics don't say 5 to 7 days or 5 days be very specific because if you say 5 days that's a correct answer if you take 7 days it's not a wrong answer but if you say 5 to 7 days it gives an examiner an idea he is telling 5 to 7 days that means he is not doing it in his life or didn't observed it and um, saying just with the theoretical knowledge you just be very specific think as if the patient is next to you and think what you are going to do and similarly shaving the skin it can be done by various methods and um, we know that the skin clippers are always better compared to using a, a blade and shave we are not using blading and blade and shave in the theaters anymore but when you come to the infection table you should say that clippers are better it gives a better hygiene and it prevents unnecessary cut which can get secondly infected later um, there are many things like for example bringing the patient on the day morning of the surgery which we do just because we do don't assume that there is nothing to express you should say because there is an evidence that bringing the patient on the day in the morning of the surgery as less infection rate compared to bringing the patient the day before so even though those practices have completely nicely cemented and settled maybe outside uk there are many countries where the patients are brought the day before so you should spell out the infection specific preoperative steps and uh, we have discussed in this same platform before about using a betadine to wash a double wash and uh, clean the area and uh, and then you will go back and scrub and come again and uh, i'm happy with your medicated implant but you can spell out what is the exact uh, medications used uh, mupirocin and various antibiotics what is used especially the coloplast one has the 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 hue the yellowish color due to the antibiotic implant and then slowly you deviate towards the malleable implant it can happen um, i will say 8 out of 10 times the examiners will help you drive you back to the course and usually the outcome is not bad but uh, but something can happen and be very careful in that and these things are happening unconsciously so consciously you can't prevent this mistake the only way you can present prevent this is by taking the exam in a very cool and calm manner and the mock vivas like this which will give you a little bit of consciousness towards that and um, so you can divide it like pre operative post operative and uh, intra operative as i said we have finished the pre operative now so coming to intra operative again meticulous dissection not creating any false planes absolute hemostasis because even if there is any small lack of hemostasis that can result in a collection which can get secondarily infected and not using a drain so those things are very important intraoperatively 
Post-operatively, of course, early discharge, early ambulation, making sure there is no DVT related problems and VT prophylaxis given appropriately even the pre-op. And then I thought of keeping the salvage surgeries in the last one minute so that if you are really doing a very speed good performance, the salvage treatment will give you that mark 8. So salvage treatment means like you will be referring the patient to a tertiary unit. There are so many evidences there to preserve the processes without removing it in spite of infection. So the salvage steps and uh, pro protocols you should be very confident of. And even in the extreme, if the prosthesis is not salvageable, there are various methods by which the patient can undergo the AUS sphincter management later on a different day. So salvage treatment is, I understand, maybe slightly complex. You may not have come across in your postings or in your practice, but that is for very high level discussion. So I planned it so that you spend enough time in the pre-op, intra-op steps to prevent infection. And the same thing you can use it for, of course, penile implants and uh, even testicular processes also. Okay? Yeah, all right. Okay, thank you. Good. Um, can we go for the next training? Uh, yes, Mr. Tanishik, I'm ready. Okay. Your time starts now. You have a patient uh, presented with sepsis overnight. You are doing the post-take ward rounds. And um, long story short, it's a 58-year-old obese female, known diabetic, presented with significant right side loin pain and uh, high smoking temperature. She was stabilized by the a &E doctors and she is referred to urology because of her pain which resulted in CTKUB which showed left-sided stagon calculi. So you are doing the next day post on call ward rounds. How are you going to treat her? So um, uh, I'll review this 58-year-old uh, lady. I'll uh, uh, take a brief uh, history from her, uh, specifically focusing on any prior treatments that she has had for similar uh, similar issues, any other uh, medical illnesses that she has, any medications that she is on, um, uh, um, any family history of uh, stone disease. Uh, on the morning, I will check her uh, current new score. Uh, then I will uh, uh, proceed and examine her myself. Uh, I'll first examine uh, in the presence of a chaperone after taking verbal consent. I'll uh, check uh, uh, her abdomen, her general appearance, uh, look for any left, uh, any flank tenderness specifically or in, and any suprapubic uh, uh, tenderness as well. Uh, then I'll uh, go on and check her urine output, uh, presuming that she would have had a catheter by now because she's being managed for sepsis. Uh, I'll then go ahead and check all her bloods uh, to see how she's res uh, responded to the antibiotics. Hopefully she's had two sets of bloods by now, one while on admission, one to check her response to antibiotics and fluid therapy. Uh, then I'll uh, <clears throat> make sure that she's had blood cultures and urine cultures sent. If she's had any blood gases sent, I'll review those as well. Uh, then I'll check if she's on the right right uh, antibiotics. In, in our trust, for such a patient, we would have started with uh, uh, coamoxiclav 1.2 grams IV uh, TDS and uh, gentamicin. Uh, since she's obese, I'm, uh, would, uh, I, I, I would, uh, I mean, depending upon her weight, it, the dose is three to seven milligrams per kg. Uh, so I would, have, I would make sure that she's on the right dose. Uh, and uh, once. Uh, once this is done, I will review the CT images uh, to see if there's, there's any hydronephrosis. She's not responding to the uh, treatment, presuming that all this is, uh, is has been done correctly. Uh, then I'll uh, see if there's any hydronephrosis and I'll plan for a nephrostomy placement after uh, coordinating with my uh, uh, intervention colleagues. I'll uh, check her INR as well before I, I dis discuss this with them. Okay. Apart from INR, what results you need to check before sending a patient for nephrostomy? Um, I, I, I would check her full blood count, renal profile, um, uh, coagulation profile. Uh, these, yeah, th these, these are the tests that I would, I would check before uh, sending her for nephrostomy. Okay, CT scan shows a complete stagon on the left side. There is no signs of any hydronephrosis. The sepsis seems to be from the stagon stone itself. And uh, she's mm -hmm. responding to antibiotics and uh, she's better in 24 hours time. So how are we going to treat her further? Uh, so uh, she, she's she's improved. Uh, if she's improved with uh, uh, the antibiotics, and uh, because she's had an episode of sepsis, I will um, 
uh, I'll keep her in the hospital once she's uh, afebrile for 24 hours, and then I'll plan for discharge. Uh, before discharging, I'll make a plan uh, for how the staghorn is to be managed. Uh, so since this is a staghorn calculus, uh, she will have to be referred for uh, uh, percutaneous uh, nephrolithotomy. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, give her the information leaflet regarding this and refer her on for uh, a percutaneous nephrolithotomy. I'll make sure that I speak to the uh, particular consultant who does this procedure uh, so that uh, this can be done at a this is not delayed, and this needs to be done at an earlier date, as she's already had one episode of sepsis. Uh, I will discharge her on oral antibiotics, um, uh, preferably comoxicillin, 625 milligrams uh, TDS for five days, and I will safety net her uh, before I send her home uh, adequately, making sure that she knows when to come back to the hospital, specifically if a flank pain increases or if she uh, gets any uh, episode of fever. Uh, then I'll tell her to come back immediately. What is co-amoxicillin? Ah, sorry, I'm so sorry. It's co-amoxiclav. Uh, it's a combination of amoxicillin and selbactam, 500 milligrams and 125 milligrams. Why selbactam? <clears throat> so uh, the role of selbactam here is that uh, uh, it is a beta-lactamase inhibitor. So amoxicillin works by um, uh, inhibiting cell wall synthesis in bacteria, but uh, uh, there is increased bacterial resistance nowadays, uh, which leads to... Uh, uh, production of beta lactamase, which destroys the beta lactam ring of the amoxicillin, and this leads to uh, 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 resistance. So the beta lact lactam is uh, 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 so the, the, the beta lactamase is inhibited by the sulbactam. Okay. So what is the role for sulbactam? What it does? So sulbactam is a beta lactamase inhibitor. Uh, so it prevents resistance and it allows amoxicillin to act on the uh, on on the bacterial cell wall. Okay. So what is the pathology of her stone? What may be the combination? Com I mean composition. Since this is a staghorn calculus, this is likely to be what is called as true white calculus or uh, magnesium ammonium phosphate calculus. This is commonly seen in patients who have. Uh, re uh, recurrent UTIs, specifically uh, speaking, uh, it's very commonly seen with Proteus and uh, E. coli. Uh, uh, this leads to a large stone formation uh, because of urease. Uh, it, I'm sorry, E. coli is not commonly seen. It's it's commonly seen with urease-producing uh, 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 organisms, which includes uh, Proteus, Klebsiella, uh, Providentia, Serratia, and Pseudomonas. Uh, the mechanism here is that uh, urea in the urine is broken down into ammonia, and this ammonia is then uh, reacts with uh, um, ammonium and uh, uh, magnesium to form um, magnesium ammonium phosphate calculi. And these can grow into really large uh, calculi involving all the three calluses and the pelvis. Do you know the chemical equation for this pathology? So uh, urease, uh, urea is broken down into carbon dioxide uh, um, <clears throat> and uh, ammonia. So it's urea, uh, uh, which breaks down into CO2 plus ammonia. That's what I remember. Okay, no worries. So um, what is your plan now? You are um, listing the patient for PCNL. You are giving her some antibiotics to take. How long the antibiotics to be given? So I, I will give the antibiotic only for five days. Uh, there's no role of uh, continuous prophylactic uh, antibiotics for this lady. Uh, prior to her coming for the uh, procedure, I'll make sure that she has a negative urine culture. Um, because she's diabetic, her blood sugar will need to be uh, well controlled. She's obese, so I would advise her uh, some uh, weight loss program. Uh, if her GP can support her with that, I'll, I'll suggest that I'll write to her GP as well. Um, as th this may lead to reduced risk of infection following the procedure. Since she has staghorn calculi calculus, uh, this, th this means that there'll be definitely a nidus of infection inside the calculi. Uh, so these steps are important to prevent uh, post PCNL fever or sepsis. Um, uh, so yeah, these are the steps I would take uh, uh, before, her, before her procedure. Okay, so you are on the day of the procedure. What is your plan? So uh, <clears throat> I'll make sure that uh, the patient comes in uh, on the morning of the procedure. Um, now, <clears throat> uh, I'll make sure that she has all the uh, pre-assessment done, including uh, control of diabetes, MRC swabs. Uh, I'll check her bloods 
uh, recent bloods if they're available. I'll check her uh, urine uh, microscopy and a uh, urine MSU. Uh, I will get a urine dip on the morning of the procedure. And uh, now, since this is likely to be an infected case, I will not do, it, do this as a first case, I'll rather do it uh, towards the end of the uh, list. And uh, <clears throat> uh, so, uh, in the WHO checklist, I'll make sure uh, that the team is aware about the possible the, uh, about these complicating factors that we have discussed. Uh, in in terms of prophylactic antibiotics, I'll again give her IV comoxiclav, uh, one point two grams, and IV gentamicin, uh, depending upon her weight. Most likely, the dose would be around three sixty to four eighty milligrams that dose. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the, then. Um, uh, during the procedure, I'll, uh, I'll I'll try to uh, do the procedure quickly. I'll not be opting for mini PCN in this case. This is definitely a case for uh, standard PCN. I'll, uh, I'll be using a, 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 a Amplus dilator and uh, uh, I'll be using lit uh, pneumatic lithoplast or a laser to break the stones down into uh, pieces which I'll be extracting as quickly as possible. I'll use low pressure irrigation in this to make sure that um, uh, that there is there is no increased intrapelvic uh, pressure during the the procedure. Yeah, following up. Okay, we'll stop there. Good. How do you think you did? I again said I'm um, I don't know why I say that. Yeah, just an habit, isn't it? Yeah. Good. Um, I think uh, initially I think I spent some time on history with the patient. I'm not sure if I should do that on the ward round, but uh, it is something that we, because now the patient is stable, so we can spend some time on history, I think. Yeah, so that, I specifically said she's a stable patient because uh, the scenario yeah. is not on initial evaluation of a septic patient, sepsis protocol and those things, those scenarios we have completed already. So this yes. is a scenario where patient present with sepsis, but you are taking post on call, patient is stable. How are you going to treat a infected stag on stone? That's the main idea. Um, yes. Again, uh, only a few small things like you did well. I'm happy with the overall performance. Yeah. The mark will be easily 7, 7.5. Uh, the few things which you can do to make further make it into 8 is like, um, again, gentamicin, don't tell the dose like 3 to 5. Uh, milligrams per kg just commit to one dose and uh, nothing wrong in saying if the renal parameters are fine I will go for five milligrams per kg nothing wrong in going for higher dose because her BMI is quite high and yes. um, you need to tailor it according to her BMI there is nothing wrong in it and um, it what one place you said I will refer the patient to PCNL uh, oh, I understand yeah. it may be your daily yeah. practice and you may not be doing PCNL on a daily yeah, as your I'm a consultant here. Yes, at so the end of the day, uh, you have to behave as if you're doing that specialty for all the tables. Uh, if there is a table with uh, urodynamics for female urology, you can't say I will refer it to a functional urologist. So uh, no, I, you can't say I will refer to a pediatric urologist in a pediatric table. Then mm -hmm. the whole pediatric table, you will be start referring everyone, isn't it? So <laughs> that, that <laughs> sentence is referred, leave it. Coamoxiclav, gentamicin, as we discussed yesterday also, metronidazole, just be very confident of the dose, composition, everything. For example, right. coamoxiclav as a calvinic acid, that's why it is known as coamoxiclav. The clav stands for calvinic acid. Oh. Uh, yes, so be that. very strong in the composition. I was really expecting you to say MRSA, you said it a little bit later, not in the initial one. So be okay. very clear the patient's pathway, like pre-op, uh, clinic visit, <laughs> optimizing the weight, optimizing the diabetes, MRSA. You said everything, but not in the very correct order. You really caught up the MRSA, which you have left initially. And right. um, regarding the preparing the list, if a patient is a clean patient, like prosthesis placement, you need to do first right. in the list. Okay? Right. If the patient is like phonious gangrene, which is like a dirty wound, you need to do right. last in the list. But right. um, stag on stone with infection, um, upper erotic stone causing a kind of pyonephrosis, there is nothing necessary to plan end of the list because uh, uh, stag on stone, it will take at least half a day and uh, you can't purposefully push this patient to the end. Of course, if there is a right. pediatric, you can do it first. If there is a prosthesis, you can do first. Nothing wrong in it. Right. But this is not like phonious gangrene, an uh, open dirty wound where you should do end of the list and you should close the theater after the list. Not like that. So as a stack on stone, optimally prepared, infection-free, UTA-free, you are doing electively, 
you're not going to close the theater after the stagon you're still going to do some more patients the patient can be done first in the list i prefer to do first in the list in a very fresh mind because it will take a bit longer time to clear the stones and uh, so this is pre op and then uh, intra op uh, you did well uh, the few things what i will say is uh, yes standard pcnl not mini pcnl maintaining low intra pelvic pressure making sure the normal saline is nicely warmed up during irrigation um, right. using a kind of a combination of pneumatic and ultrasound is better so that we maintain the suction which okay. uh, reduces the intra pelvic pressure so when you talk yes uh, you see the sentences which i say in within a second you can understand that the candidate is understanding what he's talking okay Right. so and right. uh, never lose the plot that this is an infection table so every sentence right. should get tuned to that don't transform yourself into a stone table stone. candidate right. okay so right. the ultrasound makes a very big role in these kind of infection scenarios and uh, the other things which you have missed it like you should treat the stone completely there is no completely. role yeah there is no role right. for leaving a 4 mm stone in the lower pole for conservative right. management you should treat the stone completely the patient may need multiple tracks okay right and right. multiple tracks are again good it will improve the completion and it will improve the drainage pressure. it will keep the low pressure very good and yeah. um, the exit strategy you should keep a uh, anti great stent for this patient and you should keep a pcn drain nephrostomy. for this nephrostomy for this patient so there is no place for tubeless pcnl on those modern things are not there okay so be, right. be very clear and be very strong in this and then as vinod also mentioned in one of our previous session very confident in the formulas in exam they may even ask you to write there are couple of formulas the first one is uh, if you have a pen and paper maybe you can take a note of it it's 2 nh3 2 nh3 stands for two ammonium molecules okay. plus two water 2 h2o it will result in 2 nh4 plus which is like a ammonium ion yes. plus two hydroxide minus and then this ammonium ion can react later and then the other formula is carbon dioxide plus water resulting in bicarbonate h2co3 h2co3 can divide into h plus and hco3 hco3 is the bicarbonate part and h plus will result in rise in ph which will result in precipitation of calcium and magnesium once these salts are precipitated the magnesium salts can become magnesium ammonium phosphate resulting in struvite crystals so right. be very confident in this um, uh, in the youtube uh, uh, video i will try to put all these formulas so you should be able right. to come out with this uh, formulas quite in a very uh, the examiner should feel that he has done this plenty of times he is talking okay. with understanding you should prove that okay um okay. don't try to get marks by showing your uh, humility or ignorant part of it it won't work in fcs okay right in right. fcs you should hit the nail on its head you should prove that you are not giving me the pass i am grabbing from you okay something like right. that right right good uh, vinod you want to add anything i think you want everything anand everything is fine Uh, so uh, so the only thing is you need to be aware of which station you are in as uh, you correctly pointed out uh, right. uh, so you need to focus on more on infection related uh, issues in this although utis and stones will be in a single station you don't know whether it will be a stone or a uti okay. uh, so but uh, one thing i would uh, suggest like uh, if you don't know which station is that in ct you will also look for the parenchyma of this kidney uh, yes. to see the salinity if it is a thin parenchyma i think okay. it's not functioning then uh, Should do a DMS as well before. Uh, right. Uh, right. Yeah, that is but only point I would add. But otherwise, okay. everything uh, Anand has already told you. Yeah. But I, I suppose an exam they'll show the CT, right? Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, they will show the CT. Okay, they will mostly show the CT. Yeah. Yes, uh, and uh, I will add DMS even if there is a normal parenchyma. Right. Any PCNL, okay. it's always nice to have a baseline DMS. Patient may present later with a decrease in function. and uh, you don't want to have a based in pa even if the based in dmsa is say 30% 35% you are going to do pcnl at least it gives yeah. you a kind of a confidence in the future follow up if the kidney is not functioning good you can right. have the based in pcnl to ref based in dmsa to refer back okay yeah. i agree right. good all pcnl do dmsa nothing wrong in it unless if it's like a 
2 cm renal pelvic stone absolutely normal kidney okay. patient is fit okay. even for ESW as per the 2019 nice guidelines but you are doing mini pcnl uh, because patient opted for it something like that okay Right, right. Good. We have our last trainee and last scenario for today. Uh, you Can have... I ask a question, please? Sir? Yes. In this patient, um, before the PCNL, when, when you discharge the patient from the ward after sepsis, will you keep on antibiotic prophylaxis until the surgery is done? Yes, yes. I will keep antibiotic prophylaxis both prior to surgery and even post surgery. Uh, after complete stone clearance, there is a role for prophylactic antibiotics at least for three to six months. There is nothing wrong in it because these patients have got that milieu of uh, high chance of stone formation. So appropriate hydration mm -hmm. and prophylactic antibiotics are almost like potassium citrate for other patients. So what potassium citrate and penicillamine and uh, other medical management of stones you are doing for the normal stone patients, uh, the prophylactic antibiotic will be the medical management which has to be done even after stone clearance prophylactic antibiotics has a role in preventions yes thank you good okay for the last scenario your time starts now you are on call over the weekend you have received a patient from the geriatric male ward the patient uh, presented uh, with uh, confusion and picked up by the ambulance and uh, since he's not passing urine, when the doctors tried to keep him on a catheter, they have noticed uh, quite swollen scrotum and the inguinal area. So they have asked for a urology opinion. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So I will uh, see this patient uh, as an emergency and on arriving there, I will make sure that a patient is... Uh, resuscitated uh, by checking his news and if not uh, resusc resuscitation take the priority after that i will uh, uh, speak, speak to my colleague and ask about the uh, indication for admissions is there any appropriate uh, treatment uh, uh, got uh, or uh, investigations have been done and after that uh, i will uh, uh, speak to the patient to get the uh, his, uh, medication, uh, his uh, history. In the history, I will ask about the onset of the <coughs> episode and uh, then uh, fever, uh, temperature, and he was unable to pass uh, the urine, uh, past medical history, especially he was a diabetic or another immunocompromised uh, <coughs> disease, Med uh, or medication, especially he, if he is on any anticoagulation or antiplatelets and then uh, any past uh, uh, pre uh, surgical or urological uh, interventions and then i will move on to the examination and in the examination i will uh, see the <coughs> general physical examination make a note of a muse and then see the local uh, genitalia and see the penis and see the testes and make a notes of uh, size uh, and swelling uh, skin and especially i will lift up the testes and see the back and then make a note that urine is in the appropriate position and it's draining well. And that's the examination. Then I will move on to the uh, <coughs> investigations. In investigation, I will again speak to my colleague what investigation have they done. They have done said the uh, urine MSU or CSU from the catheter, blood cultures, and what's the, and the routine bloods, including FBC, <coughs> UN, CRP, and what's their outcome. Okay, his blood parameters were normal except for increased WCC with uh, shift towards the neutrophils and increased uh, CRP. His uh, renal parameters were normal. So what is your diagnosis? What are you looking at? So my diagnosis, it could be a swelling of the scrotum and redness or is there any uh, patch of black skin. So if there is swelling and scrotum, it could be an epididymarchitis. And if there's a, a necrosis of skin, then my first uh, diagnosis will be the fornix gangrene. Okay, so when examination, uh, when you uh, part his legs and examine the posterior side of the scrotum, there is a patch of uh, black necrosis. And uh, so what is happening? What is your next steps? So this is the, my confirm my diagnosis of the fornix gangrene, which is the necrotizing fasciitis of the premium scrotum. And uh, it is an um, urological emergency. In that case, uh, it is I will uh, I will manage this patient with the multimodality team and, uh, environment, and uh, I will speak to my uh, 
microbiologist, uh, my HDUS, uh, HDU consultant, and then my surgical colleague as well in case I have to involve them. And uh, I will organize a theater for uh, <coughs> gene and, and uh, during and uh, debridement. Meanwhile, I'm uh, organizing this. I will speak to my radiologist if they can quickly scan uh, of a CT abdominal thallus for me, please, which will give me some idea of the extent of the uh, spread of the disease. And uh, meanwhile, uh, I will speak to the patient uh, as, uh, and make sure that he's already on broad spectrum antibiotic as per uh, <coughs> test protocol and organize the theater. And in the consent, I will say, tell the patient that he need a debridement and it will be a stage for procedure and maybe I have to relook again in 24 hours and maybe he, he will need insertion of the suprafibular catheter depending upon the extent of the debridement and he will need a further treatment with the back dressing and then involvement of the plastic team and I will also make alert my general surgeon on call when I am taking the patient to the theater. Okay, what is your choice of antibiotics? So it will be the ADPAR test protocol uh, and uh, I will give him a uh, cover of aerobic and anaerobic uh, bacteria, bacteria. Okay, what is your choice for aerobic and anaerobic antibiotics? So my cover? choice will be the gentamicin, uh, clindamycin and uh, uh, for uh, metronidazole. Okay, so what is the role for metronidazole and clindamycin? Uh, they cover the anaerobic uh, bacteria. So why do you want to give two antibiotics for anaerobic uh, coverage? This is my trust protocol, but some trust they use uh, just uh, bacteroids, uh, uh, metronidazole along with the uh, comoxiclave or angiotensin. Yeah, it, it varies to the trust. Okay. And I will also consult my, my microbiologist for further advice. Okay, so what is your surgical principles in debriding a phonious gangrene? The surgical principles are uh, the make sure that the first resuscitation of the patient adequately and debite it and then the start the debridement until it uh, uh, I reach the healthy tissue, which is the signs that it is the bleeding of the, uh, it start bleeding, the margin start bleeding. And then I sent the, the tissue for cultural sensitivity and for histology. Okay, when you're and, sending uh, cultures, um, how many pots, what are all things you're looking at? So I'm looking at the uh, tissue cultures for histology and also tissue for uh, culture and sensitivity as well. Okay, and um, what is your exit strategy during the surgery? My, my step, so I beg pardon, sorry? What is your exit strategy? How are you going so to exit complete? Strat exit strategy that, uh, as I told that I have involved already my HDU colleague and uh, I will... Uh, prefer to, to be a uh, patient observed in the HDU with close monitoring and uh, if it uh, start uh, uh, deranging the, his uh, news, uh, maybe I have to take him theater before 24 hours, but I will relook uh, again in 24 hour time until general anesthesia and inspect of the mood. And if there is still, if there is a margins are uh, blackish, I have to uh, redo the debridement. If it is not, uh, then I will pack the dressing and take the theater back to the HD. What is the need for relook in 24 to 48 hours? Uh, because there is a still uh, ongoing uh, uh, is gangrenous process by the, uh, you know, what's it, uh, of the microvascular area and it can spreading into the facial plans, which can be uh, even after the first debridement, it can carry on. Okay, so what is your uh, protocol for dressings in the ward for him? So the protocol for dressing, I will uh, involve my tissue viability nurse and uh, then uh, depending upon the area, if it is quite a large area, and then she can uh, do the vacuum uh, assistant dressing. If it is a small area, then we do uh, just packing and then daily dressing, but I will involve my tissue viability nurse. What is the pathology in phonious gangrene? The pathology in the it is uh, caused by the multi uh, multi organisms which causing the uh, uh, producing the uh, microthrombi in the microcirculations 
which causes the gangrene and it spread superficial to the uh, superficial fascia it doesn't go to the deep fascia and, and causing the gangrene is necrotic okay what is that superficial fascia known as uh, in the in the scrotum it is called the dorsus fascia and uh, if it is involved the uh, uh, abdominal wall it is the goes goes to the scorpus fascia and in the perineum it is called the colis fascia so how far it can spread uh, in the in the, it can spread uh, as long as like up to the clavicle in the abdominal wall and in the perineum it goes to the uh, colis fascia and it can involve the dorsus fascia or box or superficial the box fascia of the penis as well what is the usual organism the usual organism they these are there's a mix of organisms this is e coli and then the bacteroids and then clepsidra and proteus they are there okay what are all the predisposing factors in this man in the predisposing factors i i ask in the history but uh, it could be the as uh, diabetes or uh, immunocompromised or if he has a uterine uh, instrumentation by the catcher which can cause a trauma in this patient Okay. What is your yeah, time, sir? Okay, Sorry? we'll stop that. Time is up. Okay, good. You did well. I think um, you are able to fire the answers quite clearly and specifically. Um, just one small advice is when the examiner is asking a question, just give a, a very small gap, not even a second. You are started talking even before I finish the question. Two things can happen. um that creates a kind of a kind of a urgency and uh, anxiety within you and second thing the examiner may have a two part question like for example uh, what is the role of two antibiotics what are all yeah. the antibiotics you so second question i'm not able to spell out so okay. just be relax a bit maybe oh. uh, maybe when you are sitting face to face you may do better so uh, keep a touch of relaxation give yeah. a very small gap if you see the why was what we have done you can understand that it's very small gap so yeah. that it appears like you are a very relaxed candidate yeah. Yeah. and um, you did well the, the mark is easy 7.5 but um, there are few things which you can further improve further like for example uh, i'm happy with you bringing tissue viability nurse and uh, protocol of taking the patient after 24 hours 48 hours these are all very standard nowadays even the medical students are good in saying those things and um, regarding phonius gangrene i will prefer you to spell it little bit early that uh, in the history itself with my presentation itself you can say my working diagnosis is possible phonius gangrene if not something like epidermolarcitis and you know 9 out of 10 you won't get epidermolarcitis for an fasis urology exit exam and uh, you know it's a phonius gangrene so i wish you to come out with the my working diagnosis is by saying working diagnosis you are not committing to anything the examiner yeah. will be happy okay he is keeping this in his yeah. mind from the start we yeah. know that you are keeping it in your mind but in exam you need to prove only by words yeah sure. and uh, if you want really a very high flying marks and start there are some phonius gangrene uh, grading system available and yeah. if you can mention those grading systems and if others don't mention that will score very high marks and um, Uh, you can discuss with the anesthetist regarding the introp how he behaved is he fit because when you are taking the patient for next 24 to 48 hours you should know about his um, anesthetic fitness so involve the anesthetist in the first sitting and then iv fluids patient will lose so much of third space loss due to the open wound so you should keep the patient on iv fluids you haven't mentioned that you mentioned only the antibiotics and then um, you should be able to concentrate the predisposing factors well ahead I don't give clindamycin and metronidazole at the same time because both give same anaerobic uh, okay. cover. Um, there are some advantages and disadvantages. Clindamycin can cause pseudomembranous colitis. Metronidazole is quite bad with uh, metallic taste and nausea. So you can select one of the other. Um, don't take this trust protocol antibiotics like for every table, but. if you say you are antibiotic and then if the examiner is challenging you then of course you can use this is our trust protocol as like a trump card to escape from that yeah. when you are doing ct scans it is not just a ct of abdomen and pelvis 
you should instruct to include up to the upper thigh so that you are quite clear what is happening in the tissues and the musculofacial areas also and the whole scrotum penis everything is included in the ct scan if you just say ct scan of abdomen pelvis you just stop with the bladder and sometimes it's absolutely useless for you okay yeah. so when you're doing a ct scan it should be a proper ct scan and uh, bring the predisposing factors well ahead like diabetes uh, immunocompromise uh, lack of mobility and the presence of any long term catheter etc when i am saying exit strategy is like uh, when are you going to stop the debridement discussing with the catheter anesthetist and team uh, looking into the uh, swab bin to see how amount of swab or blood loss which has happened which will decide about your uh, blood transfusion iv fluid transfusion and the major decisions like catheterization whether you want to do a periurethral catheter if the urethra is preserved or you want to go for an spc uh, with a cystoscopy guidance so that you are doubly sure that uh, spc is good and easy for nursing there are so many things you can discuss in exit strategy so exit entry strategy means like who check up pre operative antibiotic discussing with anesthetist pre operative whatever the nursing clinic etc intraoperative and exit strategy means uh, you can discuss everything in exit e even you can use this same trick in all the tables so whenever yeah. there is something even for pcnl there is a entry strategy intraoperative procedures and protocols exit strategy whether you are okay. doing a prostomy yeah. or no stent or tubeless pcnl whatever so you can use this that creates an examiner end of the day you should prove the examiner you are more than enough for a year one consultant as simple as that okay yeah thank you good uh vinod any inputs from you yeah i think he did very well uh, actually uh, i think uh, phoneus gangrene uh, you'll be really lucky if you get phoneus gangrene because yes. uh, you know the set of questions which the examiner is going to ask yeah. and there are not much controversies in various questions so Uh, so you know this is going to be the next question and you, you will know exactly so pathogenesis bacteria antibiotics uh, so you said intraop uh, preop and the exit strategy and th this is all uh, they expect from you and if you do well you will easily get 7.58 in this uh, station especially yeah, sure so it is a bonus yes uh, yeah, yeah it is it's actually very good uh, case to have on the exam basically it is yeah it is easy yeah yeah and uh, by chance if the phone is gangrene is asked second time in the exam and in the first time if a candidate goes and answers everything including phoneus gangrene scoring system etc and then if the second candidate is not touching the high five marks uh, unfortunately they will get a little bit low mark not a not a bad mark uh, i will say straight forward box scenarios like phoneus gangrene you should get eight because yeah, it's a open book true. exam you Absolutely. know all the questions and you know all the answers Okay. Straight for and there is no trick by the examiner. Yes, there, there is nothing to drag out. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, guys. Any questions from any other trainees before we complete? No. So, uh, just uh, the, the, I know this uh, phony gangrene score, which is about uh, if it is more than nine, it is a uh, mortality seventy six percent. Less than nine, it is about twenty. Uh, oh my! Less than nine percent. So do we? because we don't use in our routine practice it's just a bookish or uh, we just mention in the exam um, i will say we should start using it it's it's a nice system phoneus gangrene is a spectrum patient can come and um, sometimes may not even need any debridement and get recover um, with a small necrotic patch but sometimes the patient needs even two or three settings of debridement and we know there is a good amount of patients who ended up in mortality so it's a big spectrum if you have a spectrum of disease the scoring systems are very important to get a kind of uh, audit purposes and uh, yeah. get a trail of what is happening yeah. okay sir okay. Uh, one more additional point on yeah please yeah and just not this case i mean generally in uh, uh, in uh, uh, in exams what i have seen is uh, always be sure of which table you are in that is very very important yeah Uh, for example one of my friends uh, who attended the exam along with me uh, in the morning the first station he was not sure of which what was the first station to him so the case given to him was like a 60 year old lady with storage luts uh, so he actually there was a bladder cancer station but he thought it was a female luts and went on to talk over a long time about all the symptoms uh, examination history taking and he spent about like 4 or 5 minutes just in the history and examination but there was a bladder cancer station basically so you should be very very aware of what station you are in 
and what to expect in that station. So that is very important. I thought uh, I thought I should let you, let yeah, you guys know. Yeah, yeah, it happens. Yeah, to what I uh, to make uh, come over this uh, problem. I have printed my this uh, you know this uh, schedule for the viva and I keep it in my pocket and see what I'm going to do next one. <laughs> yes, exactly. I think I think that's very very important. Yeah, that's what I tell you, and because because sometimes they ask with the lots and they are dragging to the other thing, or sometimes they ask with the hematuria and they are taking to the stones or something. So, but you have to be just one or two sentences bypass this and then go to the main yeah, so, station. Yeah, yeah they don't so usually have, say which station you are in. That's the problem. So you need yeah, to be I know, aware I have, which I have printed my my this uh, time sheet. You know, this is a time sheet. Uh, whatever this called the. Uh, Slippers and keep it in my pocket. You tell that this time I'm going to this one, next time I'm going to this one, and uh, this, that's the best thing. Yes, in the, in the scenarios like the third scenario we discussed, Staghorn Stone, where they are yeah. discussing the infection, you can even yeah. ask the examiner. Um, this is a scenario I'm doing for the stones part of it or infection part of it because both yeah. comes in the same table yeah. and uh, the examiners are quite good they don't want to trick you there is no tricks in the exam the examiner wants yeah. to give you the direct question and they're expecting you a direct open uh, answer ticking all the box okay, okay yeah. very good best wishes let us do thank few you more. very much Mr. D thanks for your input again it is really uh, good and and a nice uh, work and keep it like that. Welcome. It's my thank pleasure. You. Good. Thanks. So let's uh, call. Thank you very much, Mr. Vinod. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank bye you bye. both, Mr. D and Mr. Vinod. Thank you. Good, good. Thank, thank you, Donald. Hope you are doing good. Very good. And uh, let's call the class dismiss now. And hopefully we'll do some more sessions before your exam. Best wishes to everyone. Have a nice rest of the day.